But this morning, we are going to consider a very interesting and relevant question. Are you on the right track? Now, at work, we often hear questions being asked. Is the project on track? Is the business on track? Of course, when we are asking this, we want to know that the work is making progress and we are heading for a likely expected or successful result. Now, I think it's necessary to ask at different stages in a project or in our lives this question, are you on the right track? Now, I can think of a young person, a young graduate, who has reached a very high point in his career in a very short time. He was made director of a multi-billion company. Now, in many people's eyes, he would be seen as he is on the fast track. He's on to a successful career. Or maybe a young family enjoying the luxury of a mansion overlooking a most magnificent view in a desirable suburb. Now, surely, as compared to someone who is struggling to get the deposit to pay for the first apartment, this family is on the right track, doing well. Are you happy that you are on the right track? Or perhaps you are just temporarily off the track, but you are doing your very best to bring yourself back to the right track. Now, Jesus mentioned that there are two tracks which leads to different ending. In verse 13 of the passage we have read, Jesus said, For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many people enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. It's notice that Jesus described one is a wide gate with a wide road, but leads to destruction. The other one is a small gate and a narrow road that leads to life. Now, destruction is a serious business because it, it is more than just a bankruptcy. Someone who can rise to the feet after the collapse, you know, mentally or, uh, or uh, financially. But destruction spells off a total failure, the end, and there's no return, no chance whatsoever of any survival. Now, so G Jesus is making a very serious statement, is that many people have taken to this broad road, which leads to destruction. It is really tragic that they end up in this end, when there is a different ending open to them which leads to life. But this is a small road through a small gate. So what does he mean by a small gate? Well, to me, small means a narrow gate which can only go through, perhaps, without any cumbersome baggages. That reminds me of, you know, of, a, of an experience when I was on the airport, boarding a plane, and someone before me was stopped because they were carrying hand luggage too heavy and too big. Yes, at the final checkpoint, even though the rest of the baggages, which you have checked in earlier on, is on the plane, but you are not allowed to go beyond that point because your hand luggage exceeds a certain size in measurement, in breadth, depth, and height. Now, this restriction would mean that, sorry, no entry. Now, of course, we, mean, we know that uh, the airline wants to minimize your hand luggage to the 
uh, to the essential things like your passport, your money, your perhaps medication, and uh, maybe a laptop and a book to read, but nothing more than that, right? Now, but Jesus is saying, look, the road of that leads to life is a narrow gate which allows no personal allowance. What kind of personal allowance that we can think of? Now, I think the first one is no material baggages. Now, there are many precious things that we have gathered. Yes, we were talking, for those who are going to downsize, we find that there's so many things that we cherish. And uh, we have to say, sorry, if I am going to downsize, I'm too put them aside and put them away and give them away. Now Jesus is saying, look, if you want to enter the narrow gate, the things that are precious to you, maybe your personal possessions, treasures, people will find it very difficult to leave behind. Jesus said, I'm sorry, you have to put them, put them down if you want to enter the narrow gate. Secondly, other than possessions, what about people? Some people might be sad to go without their friends. Can my family come with me? Or perhaps, can my family bring me through? Again, it's a narrow gate. I'm sorry, you can't bring anyone through. In the same way, no one can take you through either. You have to walk through that on your own. And thirdly, why narrow? Perhaps, can I just bring my certificate, my medals, some of the prize and uh, some of the things that, that reminds me of the greatest honour that I've achieved? What about my Nobel Prize, my uh, OAM? I'm a member of the Order of Australia. Come on, you know, surely you would allow me to, to bring that through. But she's is saying, look, Yes, precious are they, precious as they are, but anyone wanting to go through the narrow gate must leave all this behind. Personal possessions, your treasures, friends, families, personal awards, because it is a narrow gate. Now, that reminds me of a young man coming to Jesus and asked for his advice. He said, Sir, what can I do to inherit eternal life? But the Bible tells us when Jesus looked at this young man, he loved him. He gave him advice and said, Look, you must enter the narrow gate and follow me. Now, the young man thought for a moment and decided not to go through because he cannot leave behind the personal treasures, the riches that he has. So he has decided to turn away from the narrow gate and go on the broad road with all his possessions and riches. Unfortunately, that doesn't lead to life. Yet many people are looking at the narrow gate today and decided, no, the broad gate is the one that suits me because of my personal baggages. This is all the things that I've accumulated in life. Now, the second point of the narrow gate is, I think you need to be focused. You need to be in focus if you want to find it. Jesus said, look, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, but only a few find it. It's hard to find. Once you go past it, if you don't notice, if you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. Now that reminds me of my personal experience in Australia. It was before the days of GPS and a Google map, and I had to make a home visit alone in the evening, and I've just arrived in Sydney not long, so I brought along a big, good, detailed road map next to me. I worked through 
my route and highlighted all the streets. But the half an hour journey turns out to be three times longer. Why? Well, for you drivers, you realize the road signs in Sydney are so small and the letters are so difficult to read sometimes, especially at night. Now, sometimes I just did not have time to read it properly before I overshoot. And when I tried to turn back, I realized I have to wait for a few rows because of the no right turn sign. <laughs> so a journey of half an hour took me three times longer because the signs are too small and easily missed. Now in the same way, the gate is a narrow gate which is easily missed by many busy travellers. Many people today are too busy to notice that narrow gate which leads to life. Some people know its existence but decided to go past it and say, hang on, surely there must be a different road. Look at that road which is so broad that there's so many people on it. It's much easier road. These people can't be wrong. Well, they say all roads lead to Rome, doesn't it? All religions lead to heaven. Many people think so. And it must be okay since there are so many people on this broad road. But sadly, that leads to destruction. So you need to be focused if you want to find and you know, take this narrow gate which leads to life. And thirdly, going through the narrow gate and going along the narrow road not only requires your focus, but you need to be vigilant and stay on course. It's a narrow road. It's just like when we're driving on a narrow road, we can't afford to take our eyes off the road because there is a risk of going off track, which may lead to potential disaster. In our high tech age, perhaps, we are able to switch off and use the autopilot, auto driver on the car. However, in life, there is no autopilot on the narrow road that leads to life. And there are also distractions. I've just put some pictures next to the narrow road. I hope you see the contrast. Because going on this narrow road on a long journey must be boring. There's nothing to see. I remember going to Melbourne when our children were young. They often asked, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? I think life, sometimes when we look around, hang on, compared with what is outside the narrow road, are we missing something? Are we missing all the enjoyments? All the laughters? All the parties? All the glitterings? That kind of lifestyle? Now surely, that's much, much better than staying on that narrow road. And the Bible gives us examples of people who started on a narrow road but went off course. And uh, the first one I can think of is the wife of Lot. That's the sin of the Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that God was going to destroy these two places because of their wickedness. And angels were sent out to carry out the destruction of these two cities. And they urged Lot to take his family to flee. And uh, Lot was hesitant because his two sons-in-law were having some second thought. And uh, but the angel says, look, Harry, just take your wife 
and your two daughters who are with him. So he was literally dragged by the angels and, uh, and sent off to a way of safe, safety. And they were given the advice, don't look back or else you will be swept away when this city is punished and destroyed. Now, as soon as they were brought out, it's really entirely at the mercy of God. And uh, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on these two cities, and they were completely destroyed from the face of the earth, all the people and everything in the city. The only four people who managed to get out were Lot, his wife, and the two daughters. Now, but his wife looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, Lot's wife was physically dragged out from the destruction and was given the warning, do not look back or stop on this road which leads to life. But she could not refuse the temptation to look back. She was physically leaving the city, but her heart was still very much in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think the pleasure and the excitement, all the things that this wicked city had offered her was too much to give away, too much for her to give up. So even though she was away from the destruction, she, she turned back and in the end she was destroyed together with the two cities and everyone in it. Now, I remember, you know, some people actually said to me, well, I don't want to be a Christian because living a Christian life is so boring. And he said, look, you can't tell lies and you can't sort of get drunk. For him, I think perhaps that is his enjoyment. And he said, look, I like to go to wild parties and uh, why do I forfeit all this and give up my pleasure and my lifestyle in order to go, go on this narrow road. And he was laughing. Maybe he was just teasing me. He said, look, I'd rather, I'd rather go to hell with all my friends who can play mahjong with me and gamble with me and we play around with women and drinks around. Now, if that is his idea of hell, I'm sorry, uh, he would be mistaken because it's a total destruction and uh, he would be... Uh, you know, there's no more enjoyment of that kind, but uh, he will be suffering with, uh, with regrets, uh, guilt, and also with tears. And it's a painful place. The Bible gives this description. It's a place of anguish, suffering, and tears. Anyway, now if you think that perhaps distraction uh, and, the, the, and the attraction of the world may be too much for non-Christians. What about Christians? Surely, you know, we are okay, aren't we? Now, I think the attraction of the world sometimes can be too much for Christians too. Think of the person of Demas. Now, he was mentioned in the book of Colossians as well as in Philemon. He was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul, working for the Gospel ministry. So he was showing people the narrow road to life. But later on, when the Apostle was in prison, facing a life sentence, a death sentence rather, demon, demons chose to abandon Paul because of his love for the things in this life. Or in another translation, he chose to abandon Paul because of his love for the world. Now the Bible actually warns us 
the attraction and the temptations of sin in the world. In First John, it says, the Apostle John reminds us, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes from not comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now I need to explain. God created a beautiful world. It is His world, His creation. And He said it's good, it's very good. And yet, this beautiful, wonderful creation that God has made has turned bad because of sin. And people chose to rebel against God and live in a corrupted and a sinful way. So when the world, when the Bible described the world, it's referring to the, this corrupted, worldly, sinful system that is against God. Okay, so Satan, the tempter, turned people against God with the with the offering of everything imaginable. All the sins that you can think of, or even, you know, uh, that you can imagine, you find that in the world. So, the Apostle John just used three to sum up. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Now, Lust of flesh reminds us of our sinful sort of fleshly desire. Now we do have desires. We are made to have emotions and to have desires for food, and uh, and uh, even sex within marriage. It's a uh, it's a beautiful thing that God has given us, but unfortunately. Sinful man has turned them to a sinful way, so that we gratify our flesh, our in a very human, in a dark, in an ungodly way. So when God is being pushed aside, put away, then we let our fleshly, selfish desire take over. So we begin to say, "Well, what's wrong with it?" Everyone is doing it, right? And what about the lust of eyes that appeals to our sight? Now, I think men are weaker than that, uh, weaker on this. Very often, temptation comes through what we see. And uh, of course, women are also tempted by, you know, by eyes, by what they see in a different way. I like that bag. I like that pair of shoes. A man, perhaps you say, I like that car. I like that woman, even though I've got a wife, right? Because I like the look of it. So, the Bible says, watch out for this lustful, sinful, corrupted, you know, senses, you know, that comes to you. Right, master it, control it. If not, it can lead easily lead you into a sinful way. So these are the temptations of life. What about pride of life? Yes, sometimes we do care about what people think of us, don't we? We like to be thought highly of. We like to be respected. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we go beyond that, it becomes pride, conceit. Yes, I do care about people's assessment on me more than God's assessment on myself. You see the point? What do God think? Seems to care little. Then what do my contemporary think of me? Now, 
Satan is very clever. He's using all these vibes, try to distract people from the narrow road, even Christians. So demons, because of the attraction of the world, decided to go off track. Now one day, the world and everything in it will be destroyed. Satan and what he has promises in this world will be put away and destroyed as well. So Jesus is therefore warning us today with these two verses, enter by the narrow gate and the narrow road that leads to life. Then where is that narrow gate? You just said it's easily missed. So I want to make sure I get it and I know when I get when I see it. And Jesus said, I am the gate. Therefore, Jesus said in John chapter 10, I just tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. No destruction. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Went on to say, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Yes, we can have wonderful life in this narrow world in Jesus. Now, Jesus is using a, a figurative speech and said, look, as a sheep will find protection going through the gate into the sheep pen. So any person coming to him through this gate, which is him, the narrow gate, will be saved. And they will find life and life abundant. The life that only Jesus can offer. Yes, there are many people on the broad road, but there's only one name given by which we can be saved. There's only one name under heaven by which we may be saved. That's Jesus. So anyone seeking life must come through the narrow gate, which is Jesus. There's no other way. And uh, so this is a good question. Are you on the right track? Are you happy that the road that you're on will lead to life? And there are many people who, like that rich young man, think about it. And perhaps there's too much to give away, too much to put down. There are things that I still want to enjoy in this life. Maybe this is not the time yet. And sadly, he walked away. We will never saw him again, never came back. And today, I think there are people who has fallen into the trap of Satan. Look, the world is just too beautiful. Maybe this is not the right time. Maybe one day I'll turn to Christ. I'll find him. But sadly, I've seen many, many people who said the same thing. But they are not here. And I doubt if they will be in heaven with Jesus. Because sometimes when our heart goes cold, we got to the point that I'm not too bothered. I remember one lady said to me, I'm too bad to be saved. I said to her, I said, look, you can't turn to Jesus. He will never refuse or reject you or any sinner. And she said, look, I'm, I've just, I know that I'm too bad. I'm just too bad to be accepted. Now she just refused to accept that. It was really, really sad. So Jesus is saying, look, don't get to the point of no return. When there's a chance, if you know, if you know that you're off track, today is the time, today is the day that you come through the narrow gate and, uh, and find the Savior in the person of Christ. Now, as Christians, how do I know that I'm off track? What are the signs? Yeah, I think if the world seems more attractive to you or to me, then that is a bad sign. Yes, it's nothing wrong to admire the beauty of the world, nothing to enjoy 
the entertainment and all the activities that is in the world. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we just compare, how many hours do I spend on things of this world? How much pleasure do I derive on this particular activity or this particular, you know, uh, 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 sort of project or whatever? Then we need to watch out in case the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of our life comes too heavy on us. So how do we stay our self-focus? How do we make sure that we don't go off track? How do we keep our spiritual appetite with God? Well, that's no shortcut. The narrow road. You keep focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on God's Word. And that's why we read the Bible. Someone said to me, surely you must have read the Bible through. Because they know that I've been a Christian for, you know, 40 years, more. Surely, by now, you must have read through the Bible. Why is it, why is it so, so relevant? After all, it is a book of old and... Uh, who cares about people in the, in the Old Testament? And they are Jewish history anyway. No. Reading God's Word will help us to keep our mind, our value, our goal focused on a narrow road. Maybe monotonous. Some people skipped reading God's Word. Some people even skip attending churches. And slowly, the heart goes cold and colder and colder and the love for God becomes shallow and church activities becomes just a formal rituals. Now, if that is so, watch out. We might be going off track. So how many hours do you spend on your work? How many hours do you spend on decorating your house, yourself, compared to how many hours or minutes on God's Word, in prayer? Do we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? As people, some people said to me, they hear God saying to them audibly in voices. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all seek and uh, expect the same experience. These are, I would say, you know, um, extraordinary. But the normal way, God is saying to us through His Spirit, through His Word. When was the last time when God's Word suddenly comes to your mind, like just, you know, hitting you with some word of reminding? Word of encouragement, maybe words of warning. Keep focus. Discipline ourselves with God's word and focus on Jesus and be led by the Holy Spirit to give us conviction when we have gone wrong and help us to get back by his grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have given us your word to guide us. Lord, we have heard what you said today through, yeah, through, your, through this passage of narrow road and narrow gate, which leads to life. Lord, we pray that you help us to make the right choice. Lord, we also pray that those who do not know you yet will take this narrow road that takes to life. Lord, we also pray for ourselves too. For those who are on this narrow road, keep us focused. Lord, help us to keep our heart on check through your word and through your Holy Spirit and through the fellowship of one another. Lord, this is our prayer, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.